Hi, everyone. Thanks again for joining us this afternoon. My name is Emily Vale. I'm the executive director of the Hudson River Watershed Alliance, and we're going to be talking today about work on watersheds. So uh, this is a quick overview, but I'll talk a little bit about the work of the Hudson River Watershed Alliance, the watershed groups that we work with, the work on watersheds report, along with some of our needs assessment findings, and then a little bit more on what's next. So the Hudson River Watershed Alliance is a regional nonprofit that began in 2005 and was formally incorporated in 2010. So we're celebrating our 10th anniversary this year. We work across the Hudson River watershed to unite and empower communities to protect their local water resources. And this is a picture of our board and myself, the one staff member at a recent board meeting. We work to support watershed groups, improve intermunicipal coordination, and communicate as a collective voice on watershed issues throughout the region. We do a number of education and capacity building programs, all of which are now online, including workshops on particular topics, a monthly breakfast lecture series, our annual watershed conference, and roundtables for watershed groups to get together and learn from each other. So the Hudson River watershed is 13,400 square miles. It includes the Upper Hudson watershed, the Mohawk River watershed, and the Hudson River estuary between Troy and New York City. And we focus on tributaries and watersheds because they support the health and the entire ecosystem of the Hudson River. An exciting new project for the Hudson River Watershed Alliance this year was the Work on Watersheds Report, which is a printed document that summarizes accomplishments and success stories from 32 watershed groups that are working on Hudson River tributaries. These groups play a variety of roles. They work on a number of different topics, including water quality, flooding, stream habitat, drinking water, climate resiliency, drinking water source protection, education, community engagement, and more. And we'll talk a little bit more about what some of the, their roles and accomplishments have been. But first I wanna give a quick introduction to watershed groups. What I mean when I say we work with watershed groups. So these are community-based initiatives that are often volunteer run focused on a particular Hudson River tributary or water body. Some are intermunicipal councils where municipalities have joined together at a watershed scale. Some are led by agencies or nonprofits. But I think what sets these groups apart is that they have considerable local knowledge of their watershed. They know their communities, they know their conditions, in many cases they know their science, and they're working hard to advocate for its health. For all of these watershed groups, collaboration is really key. So many of these groups partner with other organizations, with academic institutions, with municipalities, and so on. In terms of the types of roles that watershed groups play, uh, they tend to be really good at convening stakeholders, coordinating projects, educating residents, promoting stewardship, monitoring water quality, partnering on research projects, and creating watershed plans. So now I'll talk a little bit about the work on watersheds report in combination with some of the findings from our recent needs assessment project. So in 2009 and 2020, early 2020, I should add, the Hudson River Watershed Alliance interviewed watershed groups to learn about their strengths and needs. And we interviewed about 32 watershed group leaders from 28 different groups about their work, their strengths, their needs, the barriers that they face, and so on. We transcribed those interviews and we identified certain themes that were woven throughout these different interviews and some of the responses that we heard. Um, this was a great project. We, we kicked this off right before COVID hit, um, and it's given us a lot to work with uh, this year. And I wanted to thank the Hudson River Estuary Program for funding this project. So we know there's an important relationship between local work and regional and state level work. Implementation happens at the local level. We know that New York is a home rule state. And while regional or state groups might have great intentions, um, when it comes down to it, the implementation really happens at the local community scale. So it's helpful to understand the strengths of these different groups in order to, to build meaningful partnerships around shared goals. And many of the watershed groups do share the same goals as regional and state entities. And so there might be some opportunities here for partnerships. Success stories from the groups show some of the opportunities we found in many cases, um, you know, a, a goal, a strength 
can be a weakness if it's not present, right? And so it's helpful to look across the board at the different successes from these groups and understand some of the potential that's there. So some of the needs assessment themes that I really wanna bring out for our state and regional partners are structure, partnerships with technical experts, and collaborating on implementing projects. And I'll be going through each one of these in more detail. So in terms of structure, we found that it was really helpful for these local groups to be able to plug into statewide or regional initiatives. So to have some structure that's provided, um, like a program that they can participate in where it's clear how to participate in that. So a good example of this is the Trees for Trips program, which of course is a program of the Hudson River Estuary program and also statewide. And the Rondout Creek Watershed Alliance since 2012 has planted over 600 trees along the Coxingkill, a tributary to the Rondout Creek. So this watershed group has planted trees, done the maintenance, and also participated in other planting projects. And it was made easy because they had guidance support materials from a regional program and they were able to come in, do what they do well, um, and support the watershed in that way. Another good example of this is the Hudson River Eel Project, which it, uh, is a volunteer uh, program, often very high education value, and a lot of school groups participate in the eel project by going down to the Hudson River tributaries and counting glass eels in the spring. And watershed groups participate in this program too. So this is a photo of the Quasea Creek Watershed Alliance. And in the Quasea Creek, since 2012, over 187,000 glass eels have been caught, counted, and released. And the fish swimming up the Quasea Creek have gotten a boost uh, now that the first dam on the Quasea Creek has been removed as well. Another aspect of structure are guidance documents. So having a particular plan or, or guidance document that groups can follow, so there's a template for their work. So one example of this is the Upper Hudson River Watershed Coalition, which is coordinated by the Lake Champlain Lake George Regional Planning Board and includes a number of soil and water conservation districts from the counties in the Upper Hudson River Watershed. This group worked together on an Upper Hudson River Watershed Revitalization Plan, which was funded by the New York State Department of State Local Waterfront Revitalization Program. And by following the Department of State and DEC guidance on watershed planning, they were able to work through this process, work with stakeholders, and identify 190 different priority projects to achieve their specific watershed goals. So going through this process where they've got the structure for it, lines them up really well for future funding and implementing those projects. Another example of a guidance document is the source water scorecard that River Creeper created or the drinking water source protection program framework uh, that just came out from Department of Health. The Sawkill watershed community went through the source water scorecard and they're working with the town of Red Hook on watershed protection policies. The Sawk Hill is a drinking water source for Bard College in Dutchess County, and the village of Red Hook also draws drinking water from aquifers that are along the Sawk Hill. So there's an influence of the Sawk Hill on that drinking water source. And watershed groups can go through these, these uh, frameworks and work with their municipalities to identify opportunities to protect the watershed. Moving on to partnerships with technical experts, one of the questions that we asked in our needs assessment project was, do you feel like you or your group is lacking in technical skills? And we were really surprised to see that 32% of people said no, and they often said no very emphatically. And when they said that, they often gave the reason as they are working with groups that provide technical skills. So they may be group members or they may be collaborations with technical experts. And so it's important to note here that partners provide access to a variety of technical skills. The watershed group members that are volunteers may not need to go out and get a PhD in water chemistry. They might be able to work with a student at Siena College like it's shown in this example. So uh, a great example of partnerships is the Spark Hill Creek Watershed Alliance. And they started as a partnership with Riverkeeper to monitor Enterococcus bacteria in the Spark Hill Creek in Rockland County. And they've continued to build and add new partnerships uh, every year, it seems. So they've been working with researchers at academic institutions. 
They've joined forces with the Lower Hudson Partnership, which is a collaboration of watershed groups in the Lower Hudson Valley. They've worked with New York, New Jersey Harbor and Estuary Program and US EPA on technical assistance and providing monitoring resources. And this summer, they worked with New York State DEC and Riverkeeper on the PEERS program to take water quality samples that will be able to go directly into New York State's database and be used for the water body inventory and priority water bodies list. The Wallkill River Watershed Alliance has done considerable work on harmful algal blooms. This is a photo in New Paltz from 2016 when there was a harmful algal bloom that lasted over a month and stretched for over 30 miles between Ulster County and Orange County. The Wallkill River Watershed Alliance happens to include scientists who are experts on nutrients and algae. And so they were able to work with the scientists that are members of that group with funding from the Hudson River Estuary Program to really document that 2016 harmful algal bloom, which was a really incredible <laughs> circumstance. Um, they also worked closely with New York State DEC's HAB program to take samples that were sent to their partner labs. And it was confirmed that high, extremely high levels of toxins were present in the Wallkill River at this time. So the Wallkill River Watershed Alliance then took it upon themselves to do community outreach and making sure people understood the risks of harmful algal blooms and trying to protect people and pets from ex exposure. They didn't stop there. Um, they wanted to make sure that people didn't turn their backs on the Wallkill River as a resource. And so Martha Chio and others planned last year the Great Wallkill River Race, which was a paddle event held in New Paltz. And the Wallkill River Watershed Alliance also worked with Orange County with funding from the Hudson River Valley Greenway to establish the Wallkill River Water Trail, which, which maps out different access points and provides information on river conditions for recreational paddling. Next is collaborating on implementation. And one of the things that we found through the needs assessment project was that small volunteer groups may not have the capacity themselves to plan and implement large construction projects. So volunteer groups do play a really important role in watershed planning to identify priorities and line up projects. They can provide important education on opportunities and work with stakeholders to build support, uh, both providing community feedback and then also this, these educational opportunities. So while vo small volunteer groups may not be the ones actually doing the construction, municipalities and soil and water conservation districts very much are. And these groups are very active in implementing projects. In particular, what we heard about in the needs assessment were infrastructure improvements, things like drinking water, wastewater, stormwater, and even park infrastructure, like improving access. One example of some of the important planning work to tee up projects comes from the Moodna Creek Watershed Intermunicipal Council in Orange County. This photo is of the village of Washingtonville during Hurricane Irene which experienced tremendous flooding and it continues to be at risk for flooding. The Moonda Creek Watershed Intermunicipal Council has helped to plan two flood mitigation plans, working with New York Rising and also with funds from Nui Pick and the Hudson River Estuary Program. One of those plans is for the upper portion of the watershed, the other is the lower, and both of those identify specific mitigation strategies to reduce flood risk in the future. They've also implemented a series of stream gauges working with Orange County Water Authority to monitor flood conditions in real time. And the gauge in the village of Washingtonville in particular is linked to Orange County emergency management system. So when flood levels are getting too high, it, it goes right to the emergency management system. Culvert assessments are another opportunity to collaborate on implementation. This example is from the Sauk Hill Creek watershed in Ulster County. The Ulster County Department of the Environment with support from Nui Pick and the Hudson River Estuary Program has conducted a watershed scale assessment of culverts, looking at the size, shape, configuration to identify where culverts might be barriers for fish, pa fish passage or might impact localized flooding. 
these really detailed watershed scale assessments can be used by the municipalities for implementation to replace or right size culverts so that they don't pose a risk either for flooding or for fish passage. And it, it should be mentioned that Ulster County itself is a municipality and they've been working on their own culverts as well. The last uh, example of implementation comes from the Monhagen Brook watershed in Orange County, tributary to the Wallkill River. In 2016, the Orange County Soil and Water Conservation District received uh, water quality improvement program project funds to implement a series of green infrastructure practices along with stream bank stabilization at a retail plaza in the city of Middletown. And these served as an important pilot for these types of projects an important educational tool for the city of Middletown. And Orange County Soil and Water Conservation District has continued to work closely with the city of Middletown in implementing water quality best management practices. The city of Middletown did apply for WQIP funds for a, a plan for green infrastructure to implement a planned green infrastructure. And while they were not successful in getting those funds, they actually were able to find funding from their own budget to implement these practices, recognizing the importance of green infrastructure to improve water quality in the Monhagen Brook. So I think this speaks to the important role of watershed initiatives, like how the Orange County Soil and Water Conservation District is supporting the Monhagen Brook in working closely with the municipality and providing education and shepherding important projects along. So what's next? So we've gone through a couple different examples of watershed group accomplishments and outcomes. And one of the questions to ask is how can working with watershed groups help achieve your goals? What expertise do you have to share with watershed groups? There are roles for nonprofits, agencies, municipalities, scientists, and more. Really anyone can contribute to this work. And there might be opportunities in particular to provide structure, technical assistance, and partnerships for implementation. So I wanna acknowledge that this work is really hard. It takes a lot of different ingredients to have these successful projects. And one of our findings from the needs assessment that it was that it's not funding alone that results in successful watershed projects. It requires having these active community groups, the support, structure these collaborations, having the technical experts on hand to really make these projects a success. And it speaks to the importance of building networks, both with local groups to each other so that they can learn from each other, and also these local groups to the regional and state level. And I think there are strengths the watershed groups can bring to your work at the state level that could be really valuable. I think these are really unsung heroes of our local watersheds. So the needs assessment work will continue into 2021. We're planning on a series of focus groups and would love to have you all provide feedback on some of our findings. And please also share the work on watersheds report if you have partners or you have colleagues who you think would really benefit from getting a physical copy of it, I'm happy to mail it out. And it's also available online as a PDF. I wanted to give a big thank you to the Hudson River Estuary Program and NUIPIC for supporting the work on watersheds project and also this presentation. So thank you very much for joining us today. And now I will open it up for comments, questions.